Hi, I'm Tyler Falls. I'm a nuclear engineer, a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at one of Johnny Harris's videos called Submarines Are Way Scarier Than You Think. Here's why. Probably has something to do with the nuclear weapons on board. Full disclosure, I was never in the Navy. Um, several of my co-workers were, and they were on submarines, so I've heard a lot of interesting stories from them. But I do know a fair bit about reactors and things of that nature. So let's take a look. Enough nuclear power to destroy the human race several times over. I need to show you a video that is blowing my mind. You have the ocean just sitting there being nice and calm, and then this pops out. <laughs> Boom! It doesn't just pop out, it pops out for a second and it looks like it's just about to fall back down and then... <laughs> this is a rocket. Yes, a full-blown rocket that is headed for space. That is, that is so cool. Just the mechanisms from getting something from underwater to the surface and then up into the upper atmosphere. That, that is just a, such a cool piece of technology and that actually came into being a thing well after the first nuclear submarines. The first nuclear submarines did not have ballistic missiles attached to them. <laughs> they had, it was their nuclear submarines in that they were nuclear powered, not um, nuclear armed. That came later. Oh, and I know this kind of looks small. It's not small. <laughs> and where is this rocket being launched from? Are there underwater bases? Yes, they're called submarines. Once it gets to the surface, it flies a thousand kilometers above Earth, literally into space. It starts looking at the stars to navigate and eventually falls back down to Earth, traveling up to like 12,000 kilometers to hit whatever target the people who launched it wanted it to. It's a marvelous piece of engineering, but again, we're talking about something not being used for peaceful purposes, so. Like what have we created with such destructive power it threatened the world a deadly game of stealth an undeniable strategic deterrent nuclear warheads that can wipe out countries submarines are <laughs> cool i just gotta say it. there are these <laughs> massive floating <laughs> nuclear weapons that could be anywhere at any time that we use for psychological warfare and actual warfare and spying on people and because of this these giant vessels are actually incredibly stealthy like you could be swimming in the ocean one day minding your own business and right below you there could literally be this massive 48,000 ton That's metal machine so cool. with a couple hundred humans aboard equipped with nuclear warheads that could be launched at a moment's notice and you would have no idea because not being seen is kind of their whole end. I mean, at a moment's notice, sure, but obviously it's not something that people launch willy-nilly. They are There are protocols on board a submarine. There are launch codes. Which is nuts because these are some big boys. Like Russia's Typhoon-class submarine. Big boys. You just pluck that out of the water and put it on land somewhere. You start to get a scale for how massive this thing they're is. They're big. Like a floating building. Yeah, these guys are thick. And they're cruising around our ocean. Thick? 250 <laughs> meters below the surface. Oh, and something we're gonna talk about later. They literally have nuclear power plants on board, giving them basically unlimited energy to make fresh water and oxygen, which means they could be down here in the depths of the ocean. That's the coolest part. Um, and it, it should be included on more ships. I, I did another reaction video to a channel by Mustard talking about why uh, nuclear power plants didn't take off in uh, cruise ships or cargo ships. It should have, though. It would save us so many carbon emissions from having to use these big diesel powered vessels and so cool unlimited range though some drawbacks are some countries don't like it when you bring in uh nuclear power plants to their country like in the form of ships or subs it's just really sad though because they're safe they're safer than regular ships for decades, that is, if there weren't humans aboard that needed to come up to eat food. Navies around the world who have submarines do everything in their power to- Submariners are not nuclear powered themselves, despite what some may actually tell you. Ensure that these subs are quiet, 
and invisible, even magnet resistant, all in the name of being undetectable. And they're always out there. Right now in this very moment, there are tons of these things. There are humans on these multi-story buildings that are floating around our oceans with giant weapons in them. This is not normal. How did we get here? Why were these things invented? Now I know what he's getting at, but just for full disclosure, not every single submarine is nuclear powered or, or nuclear armed. Um, in fact, the majority of submarines that they tell us are actually fast attack submarines armed with uh, torpedoes. They're nuclear powered, but not nuclear armed. Many countries with submarines don't actually have nuclear weapons on them. United States is one of the few countries that has the full nuclear triad with uh, silo-based nukes, um, aircraft with nukes, and submarines with nukes. Uh, Russia's another one. There are probably more, and there are some that have two of the three, but yeah, it's not that common. There's a lot to understand about submarines. There's a lot of angles. We have been researching for months, and today we are going to show you how we got here what submarines can do, and most importantly, why? <laughs> one submarine has enough nuclear weapons to essentially end life on the planet as we, but just one. So I said as we know it, just clarification, one nuclear submarine does not have enough firepower to end life on the planet. All nuclear weapons in the world detonated simultaneously will not end all life on the planet. It would be horrible. I don't want to stress test this, but no. Even, uh, even, with, uh, even with nuclear winter, it's not going to wipe everyone out. Submarine. An increase in submarine activity. Russian rearming their fleet, Chinese submarines, Iranian submarines. They will preserve peace for many years to come. Preserve peace. Boy, today's Deterrent. topic is it's so juicy and there is so much to get through. Let me <laughs> tell you how we got here. People have been building boats to try to go underwater for a very long time. Like, look at this old art where you can see Alexander the Great going completely underwater in a big glass barrel. This is like 2,000 years ago. 1,800 years later, you have Leonardo da Vinci, who was busy literally thinking of anything that could be invented, and he sketched up his very own version of an underwater boat. This beauty right here. It was basically like a big mechanical fish. Oh, and this is wild. He kept these sketches a secret because he feared, quote, the evil nature of men who practice assassination at the bottom of the sea. Like he thought that- That's interesting. And I know this is way, way Da Vinci pre-industrial, but someone keeping something like this a secret, so out of fear of it becoming a weapon and killing a bunch of people. Contrast that with Alfred Nobel, who's like, hey, I'm gonna make something so destructive dynamite that we're never gonna wanna use it. And we're only gonna use it for mining purposes. It's yeah, that, that didn't exactly turn out the way he intended. We might use these underwater boats for war. Whoops. Anyway, the first known boat to actually navigate underwater was, of course, built by a Dutch dude. Dutch, man, they're just so good at water. 150 years later, over here in what was soon to be the United States, George Washington paid for this sucker to be hmm. made for his army. I mean, there could be a whole video about this boat, the turtle. <laughs> because it kind of looked like two turtle shells put together. Looks like so, a barrel just fell off the boat and is now floating there. Hey, you gotta start somewhere. The guy in there is just like so cool. <laughs> they tried to use the turtle in their war for freedom against the British, but it never really did anything useful and then it just sank. Mm -hmm. I mean, cool name, but it wasn't a super useful submarine. But it paved the way. 50 yeah, years later, we have the American Civil War, where the Confederate rebels built a sub that was powered by a bunch of guys manually turning a crank. Wow. And on board, it had a long spar torpedo. How'd you like that job? We fooled though, spar torpedo was just a fancy way of saying a bomb on a 15 foot stick. And they actually used it. They snuck up on a Yankee ship underneath it with their bomb stick in the middle of the Civil War and blew it up and both sides sank. Like the submarine sank too. Like yeah, probably should have used a longer stick there. <laughs> oh I mean, man. It kind of worked, but it just didn't really work. Anyway, I had to mention all of these like early submarines because they kind of laid the groundwork, but in the like 1800s, things up. get really serious. Thanks to this guy over here in Germany, Rudolf Diesel invented an engine that changed everything. 
This new engine mixed pressure and air and fossil fuels that all exploded and made things move. This changed a lot of industries, but the Germans were like, let's put these in submarines and run them to charge a bunch of batteries that we can use to power the sub while we're underwater. It's a lot better than the hand crank, and indeed it was. But there was one big problem, which is that this engine needs air. Like it needs to be able to pump out the exhaust that it makes and it needs to be able yeah. to suck in air to like in make intake. energy. So yeah. you can't actually run your engines underwater. So these German subs, as stealthy as they were, were still very limited because they could only stay underwater for like 48 hours max before having to come up and give away their position. That's still pretty good for the time period though, and it was quite an effective weapon that they could get air for their engines. This is a problem that will soon be solved, but we just need a few wars first. <laughs> wow. It's the 1900s, we have all these big empires that are looking for ways to destroy themselves with their new industrial technology, and they're getting good at submarines. They're loading them up with more and more batteries. Now they have sonar and radar capabilities so that they can like see underwater. And they have radios and encryption devices so they can talk to each other while they're underwater, which is everything when you're fighting a war. The Germans call these submarines Untersee boats or U-boats, and they use them for their new plan of unrestricted submarine warfare, which is is that a swastika on the map? Okay, so we're going straight to World War II and skip and glossing over World War I and sinking of the Lusitania. The sterile way of just saying we feel comfortable sneaking up on civilian boats and sinking them and killing the people without notice because we've decided we are literal villains. Because that existed, I mean, yeah, we all we all know the Nazis were bad guys, but that existed before them under during World War I, the Germans still did did unrestricted submarine warfare eventually. Submarines aim and fire their deadly torpedoes. And always over them is the threat of sudden attack in the face of enemy submarines. So yeah, being used for horrible means, but let's be clear, this is amazing technology. Like, this is yeah. light years ahead of the forefathers of submarines, like the turtle or that poorly thought out bomb on a stick thing from the Civil War. But this- That submarine itself, the bomb on the stick thing, that was actually a cool submarine for, for its time using- <laughs> basically hand cranks, but yeah, the bomb on a stick had that idea all written all over it. Have the limitation of air. They need to come up all the time to get air for their engines. No matter how scary and stealthy they could become and sneaking around underwater during these wars, they still have to come up to the surface every 48 hours to run their engines. Gotta breathe. And recharge their batteries, giving away their sneaky position and becoming way less effective as a war tool. This would be like playing Battleship, but every few turns, you have to flip your board around to show your opponent where you are for a sec. They kind of figured this out a little bit when they started to use these two little tubes that allowed them to kind of still be underwater, but to like put the tubes up and suck down the air. The breathing air snorkels through diesels, yeah. This push out exhaust, but it's kind of rubbish. Like having to run your noisy engines every 48 hours was a huge limitation on how useful these subs could be. The other thing is you're going to be more vulnerable to detection via sonar when you're when you're running those engines. You got to be really quiet on, on, on a submarine in order to avoid detection. Well, of course, the war ends, Germany loses and surrenders. And some of these U-boats that were just sitting there were divvied up among the winners, the US, the UK, and the USSR, who discovered that, wow, the Germans have some amazing submarine tech. Let's use this tech to pimp out our own subs. Pimp it out. Frogging <laughs> decades of development. Pimp my sub. And this is where things get juicy and scary. So now you have these two former allies, the US and the Soviet Union, looking at each other with skepticism. They both got their hands on this German tech and they both know that the other got their hands on this German tech and they both secretly are like, we need to get way better than the other at submarine tech, let's go. This was a huge priority, but it was also weird and hush hush, <sighs> the Cold War. This begins an era of secretive investment into submarine technology. And this is where they level up to blow all of our minds, where submarines become the impossibly advanced machines that we know today. Something that changed everything here was that humans had learned to tinker with yep. atoms, for the good stuff apart starts. to make incredible amounts of energy. And they used that energy to blow things up, but also to make electricity. And crucially, it's the one I'm for, using it to make electricity, not, not not to blow people up. Nuclear energy didn't require air. So it's the That's 1950s, true. and you got this guy. He's a Russian-born American Navy guy named Hyman Rickover. And he was like, 
Whoa, whoa, oh, wait. this guy. You're telling yep. me that you can make electricity, but you don't need air? Light bulbs going off on this guy's head because he's a submarine guy. And he's like, let's slap these puppies into submarines. That would solve all of our needing to come up to the surface every <laughs> couple of hours. A little cooling tower problem. in the background. The US government's like, wait, sorry, what did you say, Rickover? And Rickover's like, I said, let's put the nuclear power plant inside of the submarine. We got to get ahead of the Soviets. He got a lot of pushback for this for obvious reasons, but he dug his heels in, leapfrogging all the bosses till he got to the chief of Navy operations and whispered in his ear his big idea, and it totally worked. The story of how this went down is insane, and Rickover was it insane is. and visionary, and I'll leave some reading in the sources for those who want to go down that path. <laughs> Throwing a lot of discipline here, just like breezing over this guy's story. But yes, it's the 50s, and the US government set about trying to put a full blown nuclear reactor, a power plant, inside of their giant floating weapon. And they did, somehow, and it changed everything. The arrival of nuclear power has broken those bonds. can go around the world on a core of uranium only slightly larger than a golf ball. That is the best part, just unlimited range on these subs. Uh, you wouldn't, you'd never refuel these subs. Uh, the lifespan of the fuel exceeds the expected lifespan of the boat. Aircraft carriers, nuclear powered aircraft carriers, you might refuel like once, but you're good basically for 20 years. So that's just amazing uh, <laughs> that the limiting resource is not your power supply. They have just as profound an effect on naval strategy as the airplane has had on war. Once they got the nuclear reactor onto these subs, everything changed. I'm going to show you why. So look at this big old submarine. It's a Sturgeon class submarine from the 60s. It's a US Navy sub. And look, back here we've got the nuclear reactor. It sits back here doing its thing, breaking atoms apart, which the propulsion an system. enormous amount of heat that can heat up water that turns this massive propeller. And remember that spinning things gives you power, electricity, boom. You're spinning turbines and now you have electricity for your submarine. Not only yep. does the nuclear reactor not need air to work, but it literally creates air. After all, it's surrounded by H2O, so all it needs to do is break the two H's from the O and boom, you've got oxygen for your crew to breathe. Yes, the reactor does help with generating electricity and and generating the, the thrust, the propulsive force so the submarine can go. But it doesn't act it doesn't do it directly, so it's it's not fission that causes the um, hydrogen and the oxygen to get split, that's electrolysis. But Electrolysis is very energy intensive, so it can power the, the electrolysis machine that runs that electric current in order to split the hydrogen and the oxygen. Among other things, keeps your lights on. Um, and, and one thing that's interesting is you don't need to stay at 100% power to do most of these things on a sub. What's also cool is this reactor can run on natural circulation. So you could turn off the reactor coolant pumps, which normal, you wouldn't want to do in a commercial nuclear power plant, but you can turn it off and the natural circulation can still can generate enough power in order to keep its systems on. It won't go as fast, but it can be a lot sneakier. So that disadvantage of what he said earlier about going to the surface with the diesel subs to breathe, you won't have to worry about making as much noise compared to a diesel sub even after it went up to breathe. So it's lasts longer, it's stealthier, it's just a much better upgrade for the, uh, for the, for the submarine. I mean, this nuclear reactor was magic. Move over, trees. We've got submarines. And they use all of this abundant energy to get rid of salt in the water. So now the crew has, like, drinking water and can take showers while they're floating true. hundreds of meters under the ocean. Like, this is becoming really insane. The nuclear reactor solved all the problems. Remember how diesel submarines had to refuel all the time and they had to come up to the surface to run their engines and get rid of their exhaust and suck in the air? Nuclear submarines could now run underwater without needing to refuel fuel for 20 years. Oh, that is if you don't count having to refuel the humans <laughs> on board. So Rickover was right. Nuclear reactors on submarines changed everything. They are now way more useful. You can now sneak around the ocean and never give away your position. Okay, so now that we yep. can be underwater for basically ever, let's load these suckers up with big weapons. One other thing that nuclear reactors on subs that's different from commercial ones, they actually have a much higher enrichment. One that's closer 
to the enrichment for nuclear weapons. Now, there's so much design margin in these things, so these things aren't going to explode like a nuclear bomb or anything like that. But the advantage it gives you is you can start them up super, super quickly. They, uh, there's a unit of measure for startup called decades per minute. Going up by one decade per minute, um, power output increases by a factor of 10, two by a factor of 100. So um, a commercial nuclear power plant, you're on the order of maybe half to one decade decade per minute. Starting up at a commercial plant, we've never exceeded uh, 0.5, and the actual limit is 1. So uh, a fairly slow rate, um, but, a, but it's a much bigger reactor. This one is much smaller. A regular startup, 5 decades per minute. A fast recovery startup, the limit is 9 decades per minute, <laughs> or increasing by a factor of a billion in a minute. The uh, commercial nuclear power plant is like a freight train, and this thing is like a sports car, the submarine. These suckers are getting huge by like the 70s and 80s. I mean, here was the German U-boat. Remember the one, that, the thing that like really like pushed it all forward? And here is an American Cold War era submarine, the Ohio class. This thing is massive. Like, zoom in here. Those are people. Here's their <laughs> kitchen. Here's the reactor back here doing all of its magic. And look, here's where the crew sleeps. Oh, and what are they sleeping next to? What are all these tubes doing here? Oh, these tubes, kind of right where the crew is sleeping. Yeah, these tubes are what make the submarine maybe the most important weapon to have ever existed. This is where the nukes are. Yep. Submarines armed with nuclear weapons are called boomers. Well, technically, we don't know that this is where the nukes are, and any submariner will vehemently tell you that, quote, we cannot confirm or deny whether or not the missiles inside of these silos carry nuclear weapons. Wink, wink. This is where the nukes are. So, what I heard from a submariner a joke like they would always jokingly freak out about the reactor being critical just to mess with people when really critical just means the reactor is on. But in the movies and stuff, you think critical means it's about to explode like a nuclear bomb or something like that. But just a bit of uh, humor I heard from some of my co-workers that were ex-Navy. These two superpowers nerding out about German submarine tech in the 40s turned into an arms race that resulted in both of them figuring out how to power their subs with nuclear reactors and the ability to load up these subs with 24 rockets that they could launch to the edge of space at any moment carrying multiple nuclear warheads. Like having nuclear weapons on land yep. ready to fire is pretty cool. Having them on planes is pretty powerful, but you can see both of those things. When you have a sub quietly roving around the world's oceans with the ability to carry a bunch of nuclear weapons and to launch them at any point, you've just achieved the most powerful advantage in military strategy. Surprise, the Panopticon. Your enemy has <laughs> no idea Panopticon. where you are, but they know you are somewhere in range at all times, so they have to act as if you are everywhere, a few button presses away from launching one of these things. But this. What's also, what's even crazier is it's not only the surprise attack element, but the fact that it gives second strike potential because these things are far away from the typical targets with nuclear weapons. Silos, stationary, easy target. Aircraft, if they're airborne, they're hard to hit, but you can always just blow up the airfield so they don't have a place to go. But the subs, they are in undisclosed locations and in this horrific nuclear war scenario, after you've bombed one country, the country that was bombed can still retaliate with all their sub-launched nukes. Psychological sort of mind game only works if you are never noticed. So the next phase of this technological evolution of submarines focuses on silence. They start coating their submarines with rubber tiles so that the sonar doesn't bounce off as yeah. well. They took these giant propellers that, yes, are massive, bigger than you can imagine, and made them impossibly quiet. And even on the inside, they started taking crazy precautions. Like all the heavy gear in a submarine is mounted on rubber pads to dampen any vibration that could be detected or heard. The cooks even started putting rubber on everything. Like their mixing bowls and their mixing spatulas are all like sound deadening materials so that they don't send out vibration and make noise. This One other innovation, and this is from the days of Admiral Rickover that he mentioned, just about everything on a submarine 
could be operated locally and manually in addition to the reactor watch's uh, control station on there. And everything could be overridden locally, and there was a manual bypass for everything. That design philosophy has carried over into commercial nuclear almost annoyingly enough that there was almost the expectation for everything to be done manually despite the fact that more advanced automatic control system technology such as PLCs, which were primitive in Rickover's time, would, would actually be better than um, operating stuff manually. But there are still some discussions from the old timers in the industry about preferring these manual actions over automatic actions. And that all stems from the days of Admiral Rickover. <laughs> The Marine Force is serious about silence. In fact, they take pride in calling themselves the silent service. And it's kind of a chip on their shoulder because they don't get nearly as much recognition as like these guys do. They're just like lurking in the depths of the ocean doing like a really important defense thing and no one knows about them because literally that's their job is to never be noticed. <sighs> wow. There's, don't know from personal experience, but I hear about all these intra-service uh, rivalries between submariners um, and even the uh, even the nuclear uh, operators on aircraft carriers and then of course comparing them to the aviation folks and there, there's a whole subculture there that I'm not even sure I want to touch. So you have the US and the Soviet Union both with the ability to launch nukes from their submarines and ironically this whole everyone pointing a gun at each other thing actually keeps these great powers from ever fighting a war with each other. They were both too afraid of how easy it would be for the other to strike back with their stealthy subs ensuring the destruction of both sides. This is deterrence and it is one of the major forces keeping great powers from going to war with each other. It's why the US has an entire fleet of subs with no other mission than to go Go into the ocean and just disappear and just sit there silently ready to make good on their threat that if you attack us we are always ready to respond how'd you like to have that job as being a as being a submariner just going somewhere you're on a small tube with a hundred or so other people and you just go out at sea for many months at a time submarines are also really good for spying. Yep. Okay, so we know by now that a lot of communication in this world is made possible because of underwater cables. It's not just the internet, these cables have existed for a very long time. And they're just sitting there at the bottom of the ocean connecting the whole world. And they're safe because no one has access to them. No one's gonna go to the very bottom of the ocean. Oh wait, <laughs> submarines have yep. unique access to these cables. So it's the early 1970s and American intelligence agencies team up with the Navy to have them scour the ocean floor looking for Russian communication cables with the idea that they could tap into the cables and listen to them. And lo and behold, they found one. 120 meters below the surface over in this eastern part of Russia, they found a cable that connected two Soviet naval bases. And they put a literal tape recorder into the cable and now they are literally listening to Soviets talking to each other about all sorts of military things. None of it is encrypted in any way because no one expected yeah. them to dive down and find this cable. Oh, and they were really clever. They sort of only loosely attached it to the cable in case they like needed to pull up the cable for maintenance or something, the little device would fall off and no one would ever know that they were being spied on. But the hmm. tapes that were recording like filled up, so divers had to go down and retrieve the recording huh. device and take out the tapes and put in new I tapes. I never knew and about they this. did that like every month. <laughs> and they were like, we will never get caught for this. But then eventually they did. It turns out that an NSA employee got paid $35,000 from the Soviets to tell them about this operation. Anyway, that, that would be an amazing movie. Someone please make that spy movie. <laughs> the fact is that subs still do a lot mm. of spying. They will often have Navy SEALs aboard that are ready to dive and do dot 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 redacted. We have no idea. <laughs> like we have literally no idea what they do for obvious reasons. I like that. There is evidence that the US and UK spy agencies still tap into cables, like the undersea fiber optic cables that like govern the internet, and that they do this all the time. See Edward Snowden's big leak and some deep dive into that. I'm not going to go into it, but 
we know that submarines spy. We know that countries are always spying yeah. on each other. This should not be surprising. In fact, during the research for this video, I felt the insatiable desire to dive down the rabbit hole of how submarines spy. I like this spy. effect he got, and I'm glad and he posts I links for us. I'm trying to stay disciplined and I'm trying to tell this story, but leave a comment if you want me to make that video and I will consider it because there is a lot more about that topic. Let's move on. Okay, so let's get up to speed. Where are we today with submarines? According to the US Navy's website, the US has 71 submarines. 53 of them are fast attack okay. subs, yeah, and 14 the are the ballistic missile subs that sit there and be our deterrent, and four are guided missile subs. But then there's other sources that say that there's only 68 submarines. I don't know, all of this is like classified and we're not supposed to know and no one's supposed to know, but we know yeah. a lot, but not That specific. makes sense. And like I mentioned, all of these subs have very different capabilities. Fast attack subs, for example, are optimized for closer attacks. They use a lot of cruise missiles, which are long launched through these big tubes and have jet engines and computer brains for navigation. They're way more precise, but they can still go pretty far. I mean, we're talking like 2,400 kilometers away, 800 kilometers an hour. Like they're still very, very effective long-term weapons. Yeah, they're also slow. Yeah, 800 kilometers per hour is pretty slow, but they're more of just to try to sneak up and avoid, avoid radar is my understanding of it. Russia says it launched 26 cruise missiles today. 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles have hit a Syrian air base. Launching dozens of missiles targeting the Syrian regime. That effect. But again, the one that like represents the mind-blowing reality of what we humans have invented is this sucker, the Ohio-class submarine. They do have torpedoes and several other sort of smaller scale weapons, but it's these tubes that are carrying missiles, which are carrying warheads, that are the big defining game changer of this technology. So let me just break down the journey of these rockets. They can hit targets that are upwards of 6,400 kilometers away. That's like wider than the entire Yeah, United that's States. far. And probably a lot longer, but of course the Navy won't tell us these things because it's all classified. And they don't just carry like one nuclear warhead, they can carry multiple. And they're not all just going to one place, they actually get dropped at different locations. How? An unbelievable amount of scientific ingenuity. Let me explain. Yep. It starts at the boost phase, where the missile gets its initial oomph, gets pushed out of the water, up into the air. Goes up into the sky, gets a bunch of momentum, and then the engines cut, and the missile just has momentum, and it starts to fly just using the laws of physics. It's literally at the edge of space. Just a basic parabolic or ballistic, hence the name, uh, trajectory that you learn about in high school physics class. It, it really is that simple. It's elegant in the mid-course phase. The missile then just starts casually looking at the stars to calibrate its position and then making little micro adjustments to make sure that it is perfectly on course for its target. And this is where we need to talk about warheads. No, not those. <laughs> These little cones really? that aren't that little are warheads, the most powerful weapons humans have ever created. These missiles can have up to 12 of these cone-shaped warheads. They're just hanging out on the front tip of this rocket. Eventually, this missile reaches its highest point and starts to come down. At this phase, the missile starts spitting out the warheads, just at the right time, just at the right velocity, and as they re-enter Earth's atmosphere, they start hurtling towards their targets. These warheads in this uh, multi, um, multi-warhead multi configuration are called uh, multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs, and yeah, uh, they're they're pretty powerful on the order of each individual one, several hundred kilotons a piece. Now, granted, all of those combined are still less than a lot of nuclear weapons were tested in, say, the 1950s and 60s, such as like a uh, the, the Castle Bravo at 15 uh, megatons or the Sar Bama at 50 megatons, but your goal isn't necessarily to cause all the damage in one spot. You can spread this out and these can hit like multiple cities on like an entire region and you would still cause more destructive force for less nuclear material. And you know, it's more efficient in terms of how much of a country you can destroy. Sobering thought. As far as 1500 kilometers apart. So like roughly the distance between Iceland and Norway. Yeah. And then when they get where they were programmed to go, I mean, you know what happens. Oh, but that happens potentially 12 times. 
times from this one rocket. Each one of these explosions being roughly six times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Japan at the end of World War II. Okay. Six times? That would put you at um, just over 100 kilotons. That's actually, that's actually downplaying a little bit because they could, they could get bigger. They could get a little bigger than that. So that was one missile. This submarine can hold 24 missiles. Like, what have we created? Luckily, since World War II, no one has had to use nuclear weapons in any conflict. We've had a lot of threats lately, but luckily they just remain a deterrent force and not an actual thing that we use. Hopefully it stays that way. And yes, several countries have the ability to load these things onto their floating weapons called submarines that are lurking in the depths of yep. the ocean at all times, spying and just sitting there. Okay, so that's submarines. Well, no, that's like a teaspoon <laughs> of submarines. This topic could go on forever. I mean, seriously, I was, this was a painful story to do because there was so much I had to leave on the table. We humans have invented something pretty wild, something that should be impossible. The ability for a bunch of us to live underwater in these floating buildings for months at a time. We load these things up with enough firepower to turn entire countries to dust, all in the name of never having to use them. That is the paradox of modern conflict. And yet, the thing I'm taking away from having spent a lot of time thinking about submarines is that humans can kind of do whatever they put their minds to. Making power out of nuclear fission you see that? and putting That's a good that attitude into to an have underwater about that. weapon? I like, like what? Shooting rockets into space? Having them look at the stars and then land wherever they want to? Humans did this. We did it because of fear and skepticism and conflict. We did this to get ahead, to be more powerful. But we did this. And that, in some weird way, gives me hope that someday, when the best minds aren't directed to the priorities of power and conflict, we humans will continue to make magic happen. Magic that helps more and more people live better lives, making impossible things possible. That was a good ending message. I like the optimistic view of, hey, we, and that's what I admire about nuclear weapons and even and, and militaristic uses for nuclear power too is it's just like hey we we were able to we were able to do this obviously i'm the sort of person that prefers peaceful use of new of uh, nuclear technology like making nuclear power plants so hey if you like this video please join me on my journey to a clean safe sustainable nuclear energy future by liking subscribing and commenting Thank you. And what are your thoughts on nuclear submarines? Do you feel more or less safe knowing that there's a bunch of that there's a bunch of them, but at the same time they more or less it's more or less a deterrent force than an actual we're gonna use nuclear weapons in combat type of force. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.